Lord, we worship you as the one who is powerful, Lord. the one who is merciful, the one who embraced us with open arms you, and called us children of the Most High. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you. Amen. Amen. Let us continue in that attitude of prayer as uh, the choir settles down. Yes, you are Lord and mighty and holy, and we worship you, our Lord Father. We glorify you because you are God who loves us, who has mercy upon us. You have called us in the last few weeks to be like you. But we know we have fallen short of the grace that you have given to us. Where do we begin to be like you? Yet we rejoice because we don't do it on our own. It is your mercy that brought your son to this earth so that he may die. And by that, our sins were redeemed. We pray, Father, that you may help us to make this realization in our lives every day, every hour. We want to enjoy the salvation you so dearly purchased for us. We want to keep the faith that you have taught us. And so teach us, Father, how to be like you. Give us vision so that we may see the things that you, may see, you, you see. May we make our hearts soft for reception of your word and reception of your grace. We thank you particularly for this hour that you have given us to gather here so that we may worship you, we may see your presence, and we pray, Father, that you may be in our midst. We know that there are many things that have happened in uh, our lives, the noises of this uh, world, but we pray, Father, that you may calm our minds so that we may hear you. And for the words that we will be presented here, and that have already been pre presented through music, and in whichever other form, we do pray that we may feel and we may hear you. Because we want to walk out of this place having felt and seen you. Come, Lord Jesus, and be with us. We thank you for Switzerland. We thank you for the good weather. We thank you for the rain even that is falling, confusing as it is. And we pray, Father, that you may make us appreciate this peace, this um, weather, mixed type of as it is. For we know there are many places where people are dying because of floods. There are many people who are dying because of famine. There are many people who are dying because of disease. Yet here we are, enjoying your world enjoying the peace that you've given us here. And so we glorify your name. We thank you. And we pray for those who are suffering elsewhere, that, Lord, you may rescue them, that there may be a way of um, rescuing those ones who are uh, in the flood zones. There may be a way of rescuing those ones who are in the dry lands and therefore dying of famine. There may be a way of rescuing those ones who are suffering of diseases, pandemics, or whatever other nature of diseases that are out there. We are aware also that among us there are people who have suffered over the years with ill health. It has been expensive, it has been painful, it has been a struggle. And we want to present them to you, Father, because you are their Lord, you know them, you are the one who created them, you know every inch of their bodies. 
that Father, you may bring healing upon them. We pray, Father, that whatever that they are using, the medications they are using, the counseling, the um, uh, uh, physiology, uh, 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 physical therapies, whatever it is that they are going through, Father, that they may find healing and comfort in these things. We thank you, Father, even for the ministries of this church. There are people who have volunteered themselves to serve you. They have given their time. They have given their talent. And we thank you for them. We pray for blessings upon them so that as they minister, Lord, they may also receive blessings. We also pray for those ones who are out of this country, who are missionaries elsewhere, and yet affiliated to this church. We pray for them, Father, that wherever they are serving, they may be impactful, and your presence may be known by thousands out there. We are in a cosmopolitan city, one that has different types of faiths and uh, different uh, people from different walks of life. And we know who are, there are people out there who do not know you. May you make us witnesses to those people so that they may desire to come into your presence. Thank you, Lord, because you are our God and you know us. At this point in time of this church, we are in need of a pastor. And we pray, Father, that um, him whom you have ordained or Ha, whom you have ordained to be the priest of this church, that you may make them um, arise and come to serve you, even at this early hour that we have not yet even started uh, the actual search. The answer comes from you, and we pray, Father, that you may provide. You promise that there will always be somebody who will sit on the throne of David, and we can um, depend on this promise, Father, that you will provide a priest for this church. We thank you for the many other needs that are there, financial needs and um, other forms of needs that, that are in the church that, Lord, you may provide. We pray, Father, for this day, especially this that is dedicated to our mothers, that, Father, we want to honor them we thank you for the blessings of motherhood. We are grateful for mothers, love and strength and guidance in shaping our lives for each one of us as uh, being through the hands of a mother in whatever form. And so we pray, Father, that you may bless those ones who have um, nurtured us, nurtured our lives. We also pray for those who are waiting upon you to provide uh, children, that, Lord, you may have mercy upon them. And we thank you for those who have offered themselves to be mothers and parents of orphaned children. May you extend your blessings upon them. Come be with us, Lord. We wait upon you. We want to prepare our hearts so that we may hear from you. May you make us know and feel your presence in the rest of the service. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The first scripture is from Lamentations chapter 3. Verses 22 and 23. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. <clears throat> and the second reading is from Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 24. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons, the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. 
After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pots that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. <clears throat> But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. <clears throat> Let's pray for Martin as he comes up to share God's word with us. Lord, we thank you for what you have for us today. We ask that you would open our hearts and our minds so that we can receive what you have for us. Would you bless Martin? Would you put the right words in his mouth and use him mightily, Lord? Amen. Let me try again. There we are. Okay, happy Mother's Day. The Lord bless you richly. Mothers who have biological children, spiritual children, and both. Now, we are continuing on the series of... Um, in his image, and we are going through the attributes of God, and today we will uh, cover one of his uh, communicable attributes, which means that this is an attribute that the Lord shares with us, but is only found in perfection uh, in him. That God is merciful, that he is infinitely and changeably compassionate and kind. And we'll be looking at the story of the prodigal son to be able to bring out this aspect or this attribute of God uh, so that we can uh, learn a few lessons uh, this evening. Now, there are many uh, um, verses that you could find in the scriptures, but I chose two, one in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament. And uh, this is what was read for us today. Uh, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. And once again, we see that his attributes do not work in isolation of each other, but they work together. So we see that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It never comes to an end. His love is everlasting. And then his mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. And I'm so thankful for that. Because I am aware of my wretchedness, my sin, how filthy I am. And how I fail him over and over and over again. But then he says, my mercies never come to an end. That no matter what I have done yesterday, today, I can start on a clean slate. They are new, they are fresh every day. And I praise God for that. Great is his faithfulness. Now, we read this one, and uh, I want us to look at the definition of compassion. Now, you might be wondering why am I using compassion. Sometimes compassion and mercies are used interchangeably. But compassion 
It is the vehicle that leads you to mercy. This is how you feel, and mercy is the action that you take. Now, the definition, one Hebrew word for compassion is racham. I hope I pronounce it correctly. And it means to have deep, tender love and affection for another person. And this picture of Rakam is that these emotions are so deep that it is as if there is a physical or a biological bond between the person expressing the compassion and the one who is receiving this compassion. And this word Rakam also is um, connected uh, to the womb. So Rakham carries, uh, therefore, the idea of feeling the pain of another person so deeply and so personally that one is compelled to do something about it. And because it is connected to a womb, we are given a picture of a mother who was carrying the baby in her womb. And this mother would not give a second thought to help her distressed child. So compassion is a deep emotional experience that makes you want to take action to relieve the pain of the person suffering. And then Isaiah 49, 15 says, Can a woman for, uh, forget her nursing child, that he should have no compassion, that's the word, racham, on the son of a womb? Even this may forget, yet I will not forget you. Uh, we realize that we are human beings. We are a fallen people. And God says, even if your mother would forget you, I, the Lord, will not forget you. And that's a very comforting um, word coming from the Lord. Another word, the first Greek word for compassion is splach non. I hope I, I pronounce it correctly. Yeah, that one. <laughs> this word carries a vivid picture of being so emotionally moved that it affects you physically. Have you had someone say that like I've, I feel it in the pit of my stomach? Oh, that was gut-wrenching. Or oh, it made me sick to my stomach. That is that word. And so it literally means or refers to the inner parts of the body, the, your bowels, your intestines, your heart, your lungs, your liver. This is something that comes from the depth of your body. And this is the word that is used mostly in the Gospels to describe how Jesus felt when he met people who were in pain and suffering. So when Jesus saw the grieving widow in Luke 7:11. Uh, that's, a, that's a wrong uh, text, Luke 7, 11. And when, he, when the Lord saw her, he had that word on her and said to her, do not weep. So when we experience suffering and pain, Jesus feels it in a way that is deep and personal and intensely physical, as though it is happening to him, like his stomach has a knot. And so this is, this is how the Lord feels towards his children. You see in the, in, the, in, the, in the Hebrew word and in the Greek word, you see tenderness and love, but on the other side, you see something that is so intense and so physical. And when you combine both, any time that the Lord sees you in pain and suffering, the scripture says this is how he feels about you, that he has compassion on you and he has mercy on you. The, the love of a father for his child, for his son. And now we go into the story of the prodigal son, and I want us to see these two aspects. The love of the father, and then you see how the son responds to that. Now, uh, the Olympics are coming, I think it's in July. Uh, this is where you're supposed to say, yay. <laughs> 
I love the Olympics. Can't wait. Am I mistaken? It's, it's, it's in July, right? July. Okay. A lot of you have absolutely no clue. Okay. Yeah? You're not interested. <laughs> Well, uh, I am biased as a Kenyan. I can't wait to watch the track and fields. <laughs> Julia, you should, as a Kenyan. <laughs> Thank you. The Olympics are coming. But I wonder how many of you are going to sit and watch, what is this called? Archery? Yeah, archery. It's interesting, right? Let me read you a scripture. Maybe I can uh, flesh out this truth uh, of the archery. From Psalm 127, verse 3 to 5. Children are a heritage from the Lord. Offspring a reward from him like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame. So when you have children, it says it's, it's a heritage from the Lord and it's a blessing from him. He has given you these children to take care of them. And so they are likened to an arrow in a warrior's quiver. Now, when you have an arrow and a bow, you definitely must have a target. Because if you don't have a target and you aim at nothing, you're going to hit bull's high the whole time. You aim at nothing, you hit nothing. So you have to have a target. I don't know if you, if you are a hunter... I know someone who is a hunter in the congregation. You, you have a target. You go into the woods, you know what you're looking for, right? And if you're doing it for sports, you have a target too. And so you take your arrow and your bow and you stretch it and you put your eyes to align with your arrow and align it to the bull's eye, to your target. And usually you take time to make sure that everything is where it's supposed to go. But the moment you release the arrow, you have absolutely no control over the arrow. You just hope and pray that I took my time in aligning to where I want the arrow to go. And that is the same way that the Lord is saying to us as parents with children. And I have targets for my children. I want them to know the Lord, to love him, to serve him to know the scriptures. With academics, I want them to be good students in class, to perform well. In the society, I want them to be upright citizens. Those are, we, you, might, you might have many other targets. And so we aim our children into these targets. But we know there's a come a time we will have to release them. And once you release them, you have absolutely no control. You just pray that the foundation that I have laid for my children is something that they're going to stand on. But also, as a a hunter or someone in sports, you realize that once you release the arrow, there are other external factors that you have also absolutely no control, that they are going to affect the trajectory of that uh, arrow on its way to the target. Now, I stand corrected. You know, things like uh, temperature, Things like humidity, uh, things like wind, like fog, like snow, like rain, uh, things like barometric pressure, all these things affect. These are external factors you have absolutely no control of. But you hope and pray that once you release the arrow, when these factors come, that they are not going to affect so much where you've aimed. But you also know that sometimes... You can do all you can as a parent and still the children don't end up the way you're expecting them to be. But still the Lord says you aim, lay this foundation because one day they're going to look for this foundation to lean on, to stand on. That's why you do not aim aimlessly, you must have a target. So here is the father, here is the prodigal son. Now, the son goes to the father and says, Father, can you give me my share of the inheritance? 
When? Now. <laughs> now that goes against culture, goes against tradition, goes against the law of the Jewish people. Because as long as the father is alive and well and is able to take care of the estate, you don't get your inheritance. Unless the father is incapacitated, he's sick to the point of death, or he has died, then you get your inheritance. There is a reason for that. But this child comes to his father and says, give me my share of my inheritance and give it to me now. In essence, what the son is telling his father is, I can't wait for you to die. Looks like you're taking so long, so give it to me now. It is disrespectful to the father and it is shameful. But the son doesn't care. Because the father says, if you stay with me, all that I have is yours. But when you take your inheritance, as a second child, you only get, uh, the first child gets twice as much as the second child. So you get a third of the inheritance. Now, the second thing we see, the father, and this is so amazing, the father doesn't fight with him, doesn't fuss with him. He says, son, so this is what you want? And he says, yes. And he grants it to him. 1 Corinthians 16, 12 says, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is lawful, but not everything is expedient. The father is trying to tell the son, you have the free will to choose whatever you want to do with your life. I'm not going to stand in your way. If this is what you want, I'm going to So here, I lay it to you. In the book of Ecclesiastes, it says there's a time for everything. It wasn't the time for the son to do that. So the father gives it to him. What does he do? He plans to move abroad. And why is that? He must have thought about this. Because he wants to be free from accountability from his father. And as for as long as I stay within my father's roofing, he will have a say in how I run my estate. And so because I don't want that, I'm going to move to a distant country. So I can be free from his accountability. I can be free from his sphere of influence into a, a sphere of his concern. He can't do anything, can't influence me where I am, but he can be concerned about me, but he can't do much about that. And so the son thinks that this is freedom. Now as we go along, I want you to see how, how the son is taking a, a slippery slope towards the cliff. The moment you detach yourself from the father, from his watchful eye, from his care and his love, and you think, I want to be my own person, to do whatever I want with whoever I want, because this is my life, this is my body, this is, what, this is my money, I can do whatever I want with it. And so we think that that is freedom. Actually, that is slavery. So he moves abroad. And what does he do there? With wasteful, extravagant living, he soon depletes his possessions. You, you, you just know that he wasn't ready to handle the blessing of the inheritance. He wasn't ready. Because you see, it's always outlet, outlet, outlet. There's no inlet. And soon, his, his cup ran dry. He was a person who did not plan, did not invest, did not think about the future to prepare himself of any eventualities. That tells you that this young man was immature at that time to receive the blessing. And that's the reason. And then a farming, farming breaks out. Now, you can't blame the, the, the son because of the farming. It's beyond his, his power. But it came to highlight his situation. Now I'm in a foreign land. I have wasted my, uh, my inheritance with wasteful living. I don't have anyone because all the people have deserted me. The friends who come because you have money. And once the money runs out, also they whew, disappear. I'm in a foreign land. I don't have money. I don't have any friends. So what does he do? In desperation, he has himself out to feed pigs. 
another step towards the cliff. That which he was taught as a child according to the law of the Lord, he is now trampling on it. For what? For self-preservation. When you detach yourself and move away from the Lord, and you want your own freedom to do whatever you want, because you think this is my life, I can do whatever I want. And then now when you reach a point where now, even the foundation, the word of God that you were raised up with, you throw it out of the window in order to preserve yourself. You know you are, you've hit rock bottom. Why? Because this will be most degrading to a Jew for pigs were considered unclean. So self-preservation forces him to do something that is contrary to that which he was raised up with. Not only that, now he longs to eat from what the pigs were eating. But here's the beauty of the story now. He comes to his senses. Praise God for the foundations that the parents are laying for their children. Because now he has something to lean on to, something to step on to, something that he know this is solid ground that I can stand on. He comes to his senses. Psalm 51, 17 says, a broken spirit, a broken heart, the Lord will not despise. He comes to his senses. And there it is, Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. This is the foundation. This is the target that the parents have been aiming. While the external factors come and shakes it, a time comes when the child, even if they have missed, they know I can step on this because I know this is sure ground. He came to his senses. And when he came to his senses, what did he uh, plan to do? He returns home. He's, he's thinking of his father's love, his father's care, his father's uh, compassion and grace and mercy. And he starts to think of what I'm going to tell my father. And this is where a true repentance comes. Where he says, I will go to my father and I will tell him, Father, I have sinned against God, against heaven, and against you. See, he is calling what he has done for what it is. He is calling it sin. He is not saying, you know, I made wrong choices. He's not trying to sugarcoat his mistakes and say, ah, maybe it wasn't the right time. He says, I have sinned against God and against you. The second part of a true confession is humility. I am no longer worthy to be called your child. And he says, I'll go home and talk to my father and tell him this. And so he starts going home. And what happens? The scripture says that his father saw him before the son saw the father. Why? Because the father is always looking, is always waiting, is always watching. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. I just want you to feel the depth of the Father's love for, for you. Because I am very aware of how many times I fail him in so many ways. And yet the Father is always looking, waiting, and watching for me. And then it says that his Father had compassion when he saw him. Remember those two words. There's a tenderness, and then there's almost the violent physical thing that... that is gut-wrenching. The father has compassion on his son. And what does he do? He runs to his son. 
Now, the old people in that culture at that time, it was shameful and disgraceful for an old man like him, a man of his stature, to be seen running. So when Jesus is telling the people this parable, the people are trying to think, uh, that's not the right thing for the old man to do. But he runs towards his son. And he throws his arms around him and he kisses him. And the son wants to confess now of what he has done. But before he can finish confessing, the father joyfully calls upon his servants and he says, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Now notice it just doesn't say robe, it says the best robe. It wasn't just any robe that he received. Jesus said the father called for the best robe. And those who are listening know that clothing was very much a representation of status. Think about Joseph and his coat of many colors. The texture of the cloth and the color of the cloth represents status. So when the father calls for the best robe in the house, this was his way of saying, I am restoring my son to the original position as though he never left home. And so Jesus wanted to tell his listeners that when we return to God, we are fully restored as though we never sinned in the first place. How amazing. Notice in the story that this boy, filthy rags were taken off and replaced. God does that for us, taking away everything that represents an old life. He doesn't cover the old life. He replaces it all together with the best that he has to offer, which is his son, Jesus Christ. So he clothes us with the righteousness and the garment of righteousness that is Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And then he says, bring out, and put, uh, bring out a ring and put on his hand. So the prodigal son receives a ring. And Jesus' listeners would know that a father's ring carried the family signet. And this ring represents authority. And I'm sure you've watched on movies in the olden times when you have a ring and then you have wax. It's used as your seal or your signature. And so the father says that the son should be given a ring. I'm pretty sure the people who are listening to this parable were trying to think that this old man, something is not right with him. After all that this boy has done to waste his entire inheritance, his father is going to give him more things to manage. Well, that's what who God is. When he restores, he restores completely. It doesn't matter how far we have gone and how much we've squandered, how much we've seen. Once we return in full repentance and in humility, God will trust us with his name and his authority. And he will give us another opportunity to be stewards of the things that belong to him. And then he says, what? Put sandals on his feet. Because the prodigal son arrived home without shoes. And here's the thing, because slaves did not wear shoes. And so the fact that he was asking his father to make him a slave, to be one of his servants, he was actually telling him, just let me be the way I am today. But his father would have none of that, and so God will not have it either. So he was telling his son, you do not have permission to live beneath the privilege that you have been given by me. You are still my son. And then the father says, kill the fatted calf to celebrate his return. Once again, <laughs> the people who are listening to this parable are trying to think, you're throwing a party to a son who has disgraced you, who has wasted his inheritance, who has shamed your name, and you're throwing a party? Now, this was an absolutely no-no for the Jews. Because such a son would have been shunned by his father or even stoned to death. Look, it says fatted calf. And the Jews used to have this fatted calf 
It's fattened, fattened for a reason. It's for uh, um, to celebrate. So the father always kept a fatted calf just in case his son returns. Bring out the fatted calf to celebrate his return. This young man got a homecoming party of the best kind. And it seems like his father had been preparing for him too. Let me show you from the, from the scriptures what the people who were listening to this parable thought the father was going to do. Well, can you move to the next? If it's not there, let me just read it for you. Uh, Deuteronomy 21, 18. And this is what it says. If any man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey his father or his mother, and when they chastise him, he will not even listen to them. I mean, this fits the profile of this prodigal son. Then his father and mother shall seize him and bring him out to the elders of his city at the gateway of his hometown. They shall say to the elders of his city, this son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He's a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of his city shall stone him to death. So you shall remove the evil from your midst, and all Israel shall hear of it and fear. So that's what the people were expecting. But the father proved them wrong. Instead, he showed compassion, he showed love, he forgave, he restored him like he never committed that sin in the beginning. But there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than the 99 who refuse repentance. So praise God for his mercy and his compassion. And I think this is a challenge for me personally uh, to realize that um, I don't even can put it into words that if the Lord was to count our iniquities, who would stand? Right? When you talk about mercy, if you were to define mercy, what is mercy? God withholding that which is due me. And what is that? Punishment. For Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. That's what I deserve. To be separated from God for all eternity in a place of torment. And yet, for all that I have done to deserve that, the Father runs to me and shows me compassion and forgives me. And he restores me and gives me a new name, his child. And he clothes me with the garment of righteousness that his son purchased on the cross for me. So when he looks at me, he sees me through the eyes of his son. Praise God for this attribute of God. Because without it, I don't think you and I will be here today. Now here's a question now for us. Have you been running away from the Father? Have you veered off from the target? Have you been like this young man, doing whatever you want, away from the accountability of God, either your parents or mature and, 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 and grounded Christians in your life? Are you on a slippery slope towards the cliff? 
God says, come back. I'm waiting for you. It doesn't matter what you have done. Because sometimes we do things and we think God cannot forgive me for what I've done. Well, his grace is immeasurable. It's able to cover anything that you have ever done. What Jesus purchased on the cross is able to cover the worst sin any person can ever do. For as long as you say, forgive me, and I'm not worthy. He's able to cover with his love and his mercy and his grace and his compassion. And he's able to restore you and say, you are still my son. So if this is you, I pray that you make an about turn, come to your senses and head back to the Father. Because he is waiting for you. Let us pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for this parable of the prodigal son. Paints a vivid picture of my life. And thank you for what Jesus purchased for me on the cross. I pray that we'll swallow our pride and come back. I pray that, Father, we'll realize that no matter how guilty we feel and the things we have done in the, in the quietness of our hearts and in the darkness, thinking no one sees and we're so ashamed and guilt, the things that we're so ashamed of, help us, Lord, to come to our senses and come back. I pray that, Lord, you break our hearts and, and, and smoothen it and, and quicken our steps to come back to you. And we thank you for your love and your compassion and your mercies upon our lives. For I pray this in Jesus' name. That great mercy made possible through Jesus Christ and his death on a cross. So we stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene.